I didn't have to teach today and I feel worn out. <laughs> I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it was all the anticipation waiting for snow and all we got was, you know, this much. But that's okay. <laughs> uh, we pray. Uh, Father, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight and would be acceptable for the sake of Jesus. We pray that as we talk about loving you with all of our hearts, loving what you love, loving life at every stage and in every situation, you know where we've been, you know our thought processes about such things, and pray that you would teach us the deep things, the true things, and that we would not only hear them and that we would not only allow them to to ramble around in our brains, but that we would receive them deep into our hearts and that that in turn would shape the way in which we live for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this morning we are going to begin with an ancient story. It's about a, a young woman by the name of Hadassah. We, we know her better as Esther. I mean, hers was kind of the first rags to riches story. She was an orphan raised by her cousin Mordecai, who then becomes the queen of King Ahasuerus. We've got tough names today, Mephibosheth and some of the other Ahasuerus. Uh, that she leaves behind the, the peasant's place for the palace. She trades in her meager existence for a life of opulence. Now, many of you will likely remember the, the backstory. Uh, King Ahasuerus holds this great banquet lasting 180 days. I'm not sure how anybody parties for 180 days. But at some point during this grand feast, when he's had a little bit too much wine to drink, he summons his wife, Queen Vashti, to come in and come before him and all of his guests. Now keep in mind, even the queen did not have unlimited access to the king. She could only come when she was summoned. And do you remember why he wanted her to appear before all of his guests? Show her off. Boy, she must have been a hottie, right? So I'm, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, she was a 12, better than Bo Derrick. And some of you don't even know who Bo Derrick is. <laughs> Netflix, what is Bo Derek? <laughs> <laughs> that she is summoned in and she refuses to come and perhaps she didn't like being treated as an object. Who does? Maybe she didn't like being the sex symbol of her day and whatever the reason was, her refusal to come creates a crisis. Because all of the king's men are now worried that her defiance will embolden the other women of the kingdom. What a bunch of wimps, right? I won't tell you what I really think. <laughs> Maybe after the service. So all the king's men are, are afraid that her defiance will embolden the other women. They, they are fearful that they will begin to despise their husbands. In short order, they too might refuse to obey. And so as they're sitting there stewing over that, that uh, one of the, the king's men says, I, I have the solution. I have a way to put Queen Vashti in her place and with her all the other women of the kingdom. Depose her. And so as the king listened to that advice, he took it to heart, and so she's deposed. She loses all the rights and all the privileges of queen. She is now cast from the presence of the king. But as the story goes on, every king needs a queen, and so now the, the king's attendants begin to look for a replacement, one who would be fit for a king. And so they decide, let's have an empire-wide beauty contest. Let's bring all the young virginal women from around the country and bring them into the palace, and Esther is among them. 
And Esther, along with all the others, given this spa treatment, they're pampered for 12 months. Imagine that, pampered in the palace for 12 months. Lotions and potions to enhance their beauty. And then one by one, they come before the king. And finally, it's, it's Esther's turn, and when King Ahasuerus sees her, he is more attracted to her than any of the other women he has seen. That she wins his favor and approval, she then becomes his queen. That's how the kings of the earth operate, isn't it? They like to surround themselves with beauty. They like beautiful buildings. They like beautiful furnishings. They like beautiful people. That no one who is homely or disabled is allowed to come into the king's presence. That everyone, the queens and the concubines and the slaves and the servants, everyone has to be attractive, able-bodied. And that is what makes King David's treatment of Mephibosheth so unusual, so remarkable. That as a disabled person, Mephibosheth knew that he was not fit for an earthly king. That he evidently wasn't a beauty to behold in his mind. He was no better than a dog and a dead dog at that. Perhaps he was fit to be under the king's table. But certainly not at the king's table. But David insisted. Despite his limitations, despite his appearance, he was to be seated at the king's table. More than that, he was to be treated like a son of the king. Why? Because David had established a covenant with Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan. So I want you to think about, uh, to, to take these words uh, to heart as I speak them, not for yourself, but just, just, just listen to them carefully. Good for nothing, unwanted, not worth living, unfit. I mean, those are some of the, the ways in which people assess the lives of others, even their own lives. Due to unplanned pregnancies, for example, some mothers and fathers view their unborn children as curses rather than blessings. If babies or children have disabilities of some sort, some parents view them as liabilities rather than assets. And when one's health is compromised by accident or by injury, there's a growing number of people who want the right to take their own lives. Because due to those limitations, those, those uh, discomforts and or indignities, they view their lives as not worth living. They deem themselves unfit for this life. But what does the Lord say about the unwanted and about the unborn? And what does the Lord say to those who are disabled and to those who are not attractive and to those who are whatever we want to talk about? He says the same thing that he says to those who are desirable and to those who are able-bodied. He says, do not be afraid. For I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of my son, Jesus Christ. Please understand this, that King David valued Mephibosheth's life more than Mephibosheth and others did. 
King David valued his life because of the covenant that he had established with Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan. Well, it shouldn't come as any surprise to us that the Lord of life values your life, values my life, values all life because of the greater covenant that he has established with us through his son, Jesus. Our text for today from from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 reminds us yet again that God's ways are not our ways. That in so many aspects, we have adopted the mindset of earthly kings, as it were, that we too seek after youth and beauty. We too want to be surrounded by the intelligent and the able-bodied. But listen again, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. That's just a kind way of telling them that they were unfit for a king, an earthly king. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world, even the disabled and the diseased, to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things, including the unborn and the aged, and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. For what purpose did God do all of that? So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ. It is because of God's grace that you and I have been made fit for a king. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. When it comes to life, which lives are worth living? The core issue is pride. It centers on self, on a woman's right to choose whether or not to give birth to her unborn child. It centers on personal autonomy, on a woman's right to decide whether or not this child fits within her own personal goals and aspirations. Again, it centers on the self, whether or not his life is worth living. Whether or not his mental or physical condition allows him to pursue his own goals and aspirations. But we are not to boast in ourselves, in our own rights, in our self-autonomy. But we are to boast in the Lord. We are to boast in Jesus Christ who not only chose the lowly and the weak and the despised and the rejected. But became like them. In that regard, I think of of Isaiah chapter 53, in which about 800 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, Isaiah prophesied in minute detail all that Jesus would undergo. And so when we think about life, all life, we need to view life through the one who had no beauty. I mean, doesn't this strike you? He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing is in his appearance that we should desire him. So often when we see pictures of Jesus, he's like GQ Jesus. I mean, he's studly, he's handsome. I was like, oh, who wouldn't want to follow this guy everywhere? And sometimes an artist will do it, and it's a homely Jesus. And for some reason, we look at that and say, that can't be Jesus, because Jesus can't look like that. But what did Isaiah prophesy? He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. 
so that when we think about life, all life, we need to view it through the one who had no beauty. Through the one who was rejected, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Through one who was lowly, like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. We need to view it through the one who understood great suffering. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering from one who was deemed unfit to live, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted but. You know, as we look at life, we think we see things so clearly. But the truth is we know very little. Because God is at work in lives that we deem unfit for life. And he is working in such a marvelous way. But it takes him literally pulling back the curtains of heaven that we might see what indeed he is doing. And as we look at Jesus who had no beauty, who was rejected, who was viewed as lowly, who suffered greatly. And whomever, whom others deemed unfit to live, God was doing his work, but he was pierced for our transgressions, for our f- foolish human pride. He was crushed for our iniquities, for our unwillingness to value every life at every stage. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Again, when it comes to life, all life, we need to view it through the one who wasn't beautiful. Who was rejected and lowly. Who suffered greatly and whose life was deemed unfit to live because it is in Jesus Christ that we see the heart of God. And as we draw nearer to him, our own hearts are changed. That as we abide in him, our hearts begin to beat in rhythm with his heart. That our hearts begin to beat for the lowly and the rejected and for the unwanted and the unborn and for the diseased and the aged and the bedridden. And for those whose minds are clouded. That as we abide in Jesus, our hearts are changed and they begin to beat for those who are deemed unfit for a king. But who are deeply loved by the king of kings. And who along with the rest of us have been made fit by a king. King Jesus, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we will state the obvious that we do not value all life at every stage. That as many of us have looked at the lives of others as they've, in a sense, died by the inch, we've said to ourselves, we don't want that. And in some cases, we thought that if there were a way to get around that, we would just assume that we die quickly than to die in that slow and at times painful manner. And yet, just like people didn't understand what was happening to you, Lord Jesus, as you conducted your ministry and as your life was poured out, That oftentimes in those uncomfortable places, in those disconcerting situations, you are doing your greatest work. And so as we are enculturated by a society that chases after youth and beauty, one that prides itself on intelligence and being able-bodied, And so doing it marginalizes so many individuals who don't don't, uh, measure up to the, the ideals of the day. That we would come to value all life. 
at every stage and in every situation. Lord Jesus, allow us to abide in you and that as we abide in you, that our hearts would indeed beat in unison with yours. For the rejected, for the weak, for the diseased, for the disabled, for the lonely, for the lost. And may they not only beat for them, but may our hearts beat and then enable us um, by your spirit to be your servants and ministering to them and all of their circumstances. We pray all these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.